Let's focus on another situation here that we did see a little while ago, but we'll, we'll look at it in a little more detail right now. x to the sixth over x to the fourth. We, if we look at this in expanded form, we saw lots of, uh, of situations here where we could do some canceling. x on top with x on the bottom. We were actually able to do it four times. That x, that x to the fourth really told us how many times we could cancel. We were left with two x's, which is like our x squared over 1, which we like to just call x squared. And we began to see this pattern where do a subtract because it really is a difference. When we start to do our canceling, how many will be left over is really the same thing as subtract. What's going to be left over when we do this subtract? So it makes sense to subtract exponents because what we're really doing is canceling because we're dividing them out. We're dividing out an x means we're decreasing our exponent. But let's pay attention to numerator and denominator here because it's going to be a lot different if we had x to the fourth over x to the sixth, which we do have right here. If we look at this in expanded form, we'll still see canceling, but where are we going to see these leftovers? Now they're in the denominator, and that's critical that they stay in the denominator. An answer of x squared would be incorrect for this problem. So I still like to think subtract, but I also pay attention to where do I have the most, because that's where the leftovers will be after I do all this canceling. Up here, I have six x's on top, only four on the bottom. So after the canceling is all said and done, I'll have my leftovers on top. Larger number on top, leftovers on top. Over here, larger number on the bottom is telling me that's where my leftovers are going to be. So there's my x squared, the difference, 6 minus 4, down here on the bottom. But there is maybe a more straightforward rule. Well, that, that could be a matter of opinion, but let's look at it. This pattern that we're seeing about subtraction, it really must work that we always subtract from the top to the bottom, that we do 6 minus 4, that we do the subtraction top to bottom to come up with our exponent for the answer. And the way it would work here, we would be doing 4 minus 6. Well, what is 4 minus 6? Negative 2. And what do we do with a negative exponent? Put it in the denominator. So again, we're seeing just how all of our rules so far are still working with one another. I want to emphasize one more thing about this rule that we're about to develop here about fractions where we can subtract the exponents. There are really two routes that we have to choose. One would be that the rule is that we always subtract top to bottom and that our answer goes not in a fraction or basically in the numerator of a fraction. And then if we end up with a negative result like we did in this case, we would then have to move it into the denominator. The other path you could follow, which is the path that I prefer, is we know that it is a difference, but you just check out where do we have more. In this case, we have more x's, six of them, in the numerator, so those two leftover x's will belong in the numerator. And in this case, where I see that we have more x's in the denominator, then this difference 2 will also end up in the denominator. So that's the route I'm going to follow for the most part from here on out, but we'll still look at a few examples where we can just do the subtract, because often that can be a little bit of a quicker way. That said, I do think it is still helpful that we do have a mental picture of what really is happening when we have fractions where we have the same base, that there is some canceling, that this difference of the subtraction comes from what's left over after we do our canceling. Can we, can we state this rule now? If we have a fraction where it's same base, numerator and denominator, we know the rule says that we subtract top to bottom. So our answer will have the same base A. Our exponent will be whatever we get when we subtract top to bottom, M minus N. The way this rule would be applied would be if we have x to the 10th over x to the 3rd, we could subtract 10 minus 3, 7, x to the 7th. 
This rule would also be applied in this case. 5 minus 4 is 1, so our answer would be 2 to the power of 1, or just 2. What about this x to the 7th over x to the 7th? Well, part of me wants you to say, hey, guy, I know any fraction where numerator and denominator are the same, it equals 1. And that's thrilling. If, if you see that, for sure, that, that for sure still works. But what about with our subtract rule? This would be 7 minus 7 is 0. And x to the power of 0, we have decided it must equal 1. So I might even say here's another example to support why something to the power of 0 must be 1. Because if it starts this way, subtracting 7 minus 7 would equal 0. And we should know any fraction, numerator and denominator are the same, it equals 1. A couple of quick examples of where this pattern will not work. If our bases are not the same, x to the 7th over y to the 5th, there's nothing we can do with our exponents in this case. 3 to the 2nd over 4 to the 3rd, again, we have different bases, so we cannot do any subtraction of our exponents here. What would I do in this case? I'd, I'd probably just turn these into their actual numerical values and then see, is this a fraction that I can simplify? In this case, it is not. 3 to the 2nd, 9, 4 to the 3rd, 64, and, and it's a simplified fraction. Here are four more quick ones for you to try, so pause the video, try these, and then come back and we'll look at the answers. With each of these examples, I am going to look at two different ways that we could handle these. One way is where we see that our subtract rule could be applied to all of these, uh, well, at least these three here, where it's same base, top and bottom, looks like this might be some kind of oddball that we'll, we'll look at. But we'll also look at what's my preference, which is as soon as I see a negative exponent, I move it, okay? For this first example, here's how these two ways would play out. To just go ahead and do the subtract, it must be top to bottom, so this is negative 3 minus 8, that's negative 11, and finally, it's a negative exponent, so I need to throw that in the denominator, and I have 1 over x to the 11th. This path is, is a nice quick one, but we often, some folks will avoid it just because of having to work with these negatives. It's an easy place to go off path, and it's an unfortunate type of mistake to make in a, in a much more complicated problem than just a subtraction. So if we're going to do the subtract, we really have to be cautious about our signs, and we have to make sure to not finish with any negative exponents. But a way that I prefer that makes me really not have to deal with the negative numbers so much is that I right away, when I see a negative exponent, I move that. So I look at this and I set up a new fraction, and I see x to the negative 3, negative exponent should be moved down to the denominator. Actually, what I did just there, there's my x to the negative 3 moved down low, what did I do with this x to the 8th? Didn't move because positive exponent. So this has a positive exponent down here in the denominator, so it should absolutely stay in the denominator. Our, our flow here is that negative exponents get moved, positive exponents stay exactly where they are. Now if we get to a case where we've moved something and there's nothing left over, we should always put back a 1. And it's important that our result here, we see that this x8 times x to the third, we can add those exponents and get x to the 11, and make sure that it's down there in the denominator. It's absolutely where it must be. If it is not 1 over x to the 11th, it's not correct. So quick recap, two different paths that we're going to explore here. One is where we just do subtract the exponent top to bottom, and the other is where we move a negative exponent, and the, and the, the the advantage of doing that is that we don't really have to operate on negative numbers. So let's look at the other ones here. We decided that top one is 1 over x to the 11. How about this example down here? If we choose to just go right for the subtract, it's 5 minus negative 5. Careful there, this is always when it's a fraction we subtract, but this is a negative. So it's 5 minus negative 5. And minus negative, we'll know that that's add. This is really 5 plus 5, x to the 10th. We definitely want to get to this answer, x to the 10th. 
our alternate path would be that I see x to the 5, I keep that on top. Here's an x to the negative 5, so I move that from the bottom up to the top. Nothing left over on the bottom, that's a 1. And now look at what we have, x to the power of positive 5 times another x to the power of positive 5. So 5x's with another 5x's, 10x's. Yes, it's x to the 10th over 1, but when the 1 is in the denominator, we cut it loose. 1 in the numerator, we absolutely have to see that sticking there and our answer in the denominator. But here, 1 in the denominator, that's the time that we can cut it loose and just go with x to the 10th. Let's look at this third example in two different ways. Our first way would be that we just go right for the subtract, top to bottom, negative 3 minus negative 4. Another case where minus negative, we make that a plus. So it's 2 to the power of negative 3 plus 4. That's 1. So 2 to the power of 1 equals 2. Our result should equal 2. My favorite approach would be where we move these negative exponents. So I see 2 to the negative 3 on top. I make it 2 to the positive 3 on the bottom. And this 2, neg 2 to the negative 4 on the bottom, I make that 2 to the positive 4 on top. And now I begin to think about expanded form and canceling. If I have four twos on top, but only three on the bottom, when these things cancel, I'll have only one left over, and that one left over is going to be on top, because that's where I had more. I had four on top, three on the bottom, so after the canceling is done, I'll have just one left over on top. That one, two equals two. Last example here, um, I actually, at this point, since our bases are different, I cannot do that subtract rule. My, my fallback plan is that I start to move these negative exponents and see where that takes me. So 4 to the negative 2 on top, that's going to be 4 to the positive 2 on the bottom. 2 to the negative 1 on the bottom becomes 2 to the positive 1 on top. And then what should we do? The bases still are not the same, so in that case, I evaluate these numbers and then see if I'm left with some fraction I might be able to simplify. 2 to the power of 1 in the numerator is 2. 4 squared in the denominator is 16, so I've made this a fraction 2 over 16, which we definitely can simplify to 1 8th. And that's where I would go with that last example. A uh, little bit different because we had different bases, so I just take these into numbers and, and try to simplify that fraction. Here's an example for you to try. We're going to apply the rules that we've been using so far. You'll notice we don't even have negative exponents here, so I'm kind of taking you back a little ways just to make sure we're still smooth on those earlier situations we covered. So pause the video, work through this problem, and then we'll check out the answer together. Well, my approach th for these problems is that I first deal with these exponents that are outside parentheses. These exponents need to be worked into each base that is inside the parentheses. Even if I don't see an exponent, I know it needs that exponent of 3. So this first expression here becomes 2 to the 3rd, x to the 6th, because we're multiplying that exponent outside of parentheses in. And here, this y becomes y to the 3rd. Now in this expression, we're working in an exponent of 2. This becomes 3 to the 2nd x to the second, remember that exponent of 2 is really just on the y, the x has its exponent just of 1, so it becomes from x to the power of 1 to x to the power of 2. Here is where we see multiply exponents to make y to the power of 4. And don't forget the denominator, 4 also gets exponent of 2. So I've worked in these exponents and I'm, I'm at this place right here. Now is when we really begin to put these number parts together, but I've got some fractions, so I'm actually going to set up a blank fraction here so I have some places to put things into the numerator and into the denominator. Let's take care of some of these numbers first. I've got 2 to the 3rd is 8, and 3 to the 2nd is 9. I'll be multiplying 8 times 9. I have a 4 to the 2nd in the denominator, so that's going to be a 16. Let's look at our variables. x to the 6th to go along with x squared. 
So I can put these together. They're, they are being multiplied, so I can add those exponents. x to the 6th and x to the 2nd would give us x to the 8th. What about the y's? Now a little bit different because we have a y in the numerator and y in the denominator. So we have to now think, subtract. What's going to be the difference here? 4 on top with 3 on the bottom. We'll see, some, we'll see 3 of those get canceled. We'll have 1 left over, a difference of 1. 4 minus 3, 1. And since we had more y's up top, that's where that 1y is going to have to end up, up in the numerator. Let's do just a little bit of cleanup. Uh, can we do some simplifying of these numbers here? I see an 8 over 16. You know, we could definitely multiply 8 times 9, 72, and then simplify 72 over 16, but it's often quicker, easier to cancel, and we still see some factors. The 8 over 16, that's 1 over 2, and I don't think there's any more simplifying we can do with our numbers. So our result here is that we have in the numerator, 9x8, x, x to the 8th times y, there it is, 9x to the 8th y, over 2, the denominator just 2. Uh, we could see this written in a little bit of a different way that we often like to see just our coefficients out front. Since our denominator here was just a 2, no variables, we could maybe put that 9 over 2 as a number out front. Remember what we say about parts that look like they're not in a fraction. They really act like they're in a numerator. So that still goes along with what we've talked about so far. Here I see it up in the numerator. If I don't see it in a fraction, it acts like it is in a numerator. Something that we would want to avoid, however, would be having this x to the 8th y somehow show up down here in the denominator by the 2. That would be wrong, because we can see our x8th y up here in the numerator.